everyone for joining us uh, today at Skype a Scientist Live. We are currently in a takeover by Black and Neuro, which is just awesome. Um, if you want to check out what they've been doing all week, it's been a whole week of events, panels, um, all sorts of really cool stuff. And a lot of those panels were recorded and posted online. So you can watch them now, even if they happened a couple days ago. So if you go on social media, look at the hashtag black in neuro, um, you'll see all the cool stuff happening. So um, I very much encourage you to do that. The point is really just to highlight um, all the awesome black scientists that are working on brains and neuroscience. Um, so we think it's just the best. And we're really, really happy to be a part of it at Skype a Scientist. So um, today we're going to be talking uh, to Sade all about the brain and specifically uh, being a movie critic, I can't wait to see how uh, that plays out. I'm really excited to hear from you today, Sade. Um, all right, so I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, and if anyone has questions throughout, please don't be shy. That's what we're here for. Um, go to the Q&A and submit your questions and um, we'll ask them. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you to both Black and Neuro and Skype a Scientist for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you all. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. And if anyone has trouble seeing anything, let me know. I'll try to advance the slides as I go. So, hi everyone. As I said before, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Shade Abiyodin. I am an incoming PhD student at Princeton and I'll talk a little bit about an intro, but what I'm going to be talking about today is Your Brain, the Film Critic. So there we go. So a little introduction into who I am. So as I said before, my name is Shade Abiyodin. I am an incoming first year PhD student at the Princeton Neuroscience Institute. Um, I actually got my undergraduate degree in neuroscience with a minor in psychology from Duke University. I graduated from there in 2018. It doesn't seem that long ago, honestly. Um, and what my research focuses on right now or what I'm looking to focus on in my PhD is this topic known as neurocinematics. Um, otherwise, I guess you could just call it the neuroscience of film. Um, and aside from my research pursuits and my research interests, I'm actually also very creatively interested in film. So I'm actually a filmmaker. I've made uh, several projects, including a short film that I'll get to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, and before hopping into the actual, I guess, meat of today's discussion, I really like to highlight and focus on the topic of exploration. So I think we're moving into a time and a space where people are really adopting this mentality that exploring is okay. You know, like figure out who, what you're interested in, what you want to do, and that's really okay to do. But if anything, I like to change that language from saying exploring is okay to saying exploring is necessary. Um, I think about how I came into the person I am today, both as a scientist, as a creator, and how those two were very much intertwined um, because of the research opportunities that I got to both conduct and then present, uh, kind of deliver the research, and the research community I got to do that with. So here I'm pictured with the lab that I did a two-year post back. so that's a full-time position that I was in after graduating from Duke um, at Duke University, and that's the group that I did it with, some wonderful people at the McCab Lab. Um, but how that was very simultaneous and very intertwined with my creative interest and actually opened the door to my creative interest being realized. And so here is a picture of me while I was directing my short film and the team that I got to do that with. So rather than disentangling the two and saying I'm the scientist or the artist, I like to say I'm the scientist and the artist. But hopping into the meat of things. So my love of film really started with three key pieces. These are, of course, not the only films that I've ever loved. but three major ones that have influenced my understanding of film and filmmaking. The first is Moonlight, which was directed by Barry Jenkins in 2016, and it's a story of a young boy as he becomes a young man and explores different aspects of his identity, his relationships, um, and it's just a very beautiful piece. Um, the next is Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which came out in 2010, which is directed by Edgar Wright, and this is a very highly stylistic, fun, like video game graphic novel type film, which explores his character Scott Pilgrim as he has to fight against his new girlfriend's evil exes to win her heart. And then lastly is another one, Fantastic Mr. Fox by director Wes Anderson, which came out in 2009. And if you've ever seen a Wes Anderson film, you know they're very fun and quirky as a very specific style. And this is one of his claymation films that he did, which basically follows a fox and his family as they try to protect their land from the uh, predatory farmers that are trying to steal it. 
And these films all fall into very different genres, very different categories. The directors had very unique approaches to making the films happen. But one thing that I think I saw in common in them is that it moved me from the space of just being a person who enjoyed watching films and was consuming them to a person who really was appreciating how they were created. They were very intentional in the stylistic choices that they made, the characters, the, the colors, the cinematography, and they were able to build these worlds within the genres that they existed in. So in many ways, these three directors, as well as many others, were my first filmmaking teachers as they really taught me the art of film craft. Um, and so taking all of these together, as well as many other references, these all led me to my own creative pursuit, which was Godspeed. So um, it was released in 2020, so this year, but I actually wrote, produced, and directed it in 2019. And it's a short film that follows a young character through four different stages of her life and the challenges with faith, womanhood, and blackness that she experiences in each of those stages. Um, and I really took a lot of the elements that I'd seen, a lot of the references I'd seen in other films, as well as this notion and understanding of um, sort of the intentional process of creating a cognitive picture to make this film. And so in many ways, I think I said this earlier this week, but Godspeed was my first kind of experiment or exploration of neurocinematics, so uh, the neuroscience behind film. But of course, we come to the big question, how does film relate to neuroscience? Um, and to really dive into this, there's one key term that I have to define first, and that is naturalistic stimuli. So you've heard me say the term neurocinematics before, you know, it's been floating around this week, but really when we're thinking about it in a scientific context and with the research that's been done, um, how it's discussed in the field, you're much more likely to hear the term naturalistic stimuli used. I pulled this definition directly from the paper and I'll just read it out to you. It's essentially the, or media such as movies, stories, and music, that mirror experiences from everyday life and help us understand questions about the behavior of the mind in generalizable contexts. So basically, we're taking things that you would encounter in everyday life, whether it be a story spoken or written, um, a piece of music or a short film clip, and saying we want to bring it into the research context to understand how your behavior exists or what happen outside of that research context. So you never want to ask a research question and only have it relevant or uh, pertinent within the experimental conditions. You want to be able to generalize and really take it out into the real world. So that's the, one of the um, appeals of naturalistic stimuli. So from here on in, I'll be referring to both neurocinematics, naturalistic stimuli, and when I'm talking about it in context with things I'm interested in, I'll mostly be talking about visual related, so visual stories, visual narratives. So with that in mind, so when we're taking naturalistic stimuli and thinking about how it applies to our understanding of the brain, there are many different approaches we can take to understanding this, but it all starts with sensation. So as we know, we mostly utilized five main senses, which are hearing, touching, seeing, tasting, and smelling. I always like mix those up or accidentally double one or something like that. Um, and thinking about visual narratives, so visual stories that we see on a screen, those usually touch on two main sensory modalities. That is vision, so what you're actually seeing, whether it be the characters, the costumes, the scenes themselves, the color, the cinematography choices. But then in addition to that with visual narratives, you have this added element of the auditory input or the auditory stimulus. So you're not just watching things happen, you're also hearing the dialogue, you're taking in the music, the score that's chosen, you're taking in any sound effects. And this is both with, I guess, narrative work, but also even sporting events. Think about how you're listening to the commentary that's happening. Think about how you're listening to the cheering and everything like that. So it all starts with sensation. And once we go beyond sensation, there are many different ways that we can categorize the evaluation or understanding of how this is all manifested in the brain. Um, so I'll just explore some of those subcategories now, starting with perception. So when we think about perception, we focus on how do I take this input, this information that I've been given, and really put it in context to understand more about that given information, about the world around me, or about myself? How do I perceive this information? And with perception, you can use that visual information to kind of put together the pieces of a puzzle, so um, get to a certain conclusion about a gathered amount of information that you've received. You can get from point A to point B with um, you know, creating schemas and really co kind of coding events and organizing those. 
or you can create a network of information. So bring in different information from different contexts that you've been in to really understand more about the bigger picture. It also touches on memory. So there are two main areas that I think in, in my understanding or in my thinking about it, it can affect memory. One being the fact that there are many memorable visual moments, especially from movies and films. I think about when I was younger, watching that scene from The Lion King where young Simba is lifted by Rafiki. It's, it's, I'm not actively trying to remember that or kind of envision that, but that's a memory that's very much lodged in my head. It's stuck there. What about that made it memorable? But also there can be the presentation of a new visual stimulus and or information that you've never seen before, but it evokes a deep kind of, kind of buried memory that's completely unrelated from the present, presented information. So what is it about something that you watch that reminds you of something else? So that's how it can touch on memory. And last but not least, one of my favorites is emotion. So many a time when we're watching a particular visual piece, we feel something. We have emotions that are elicited. We feel shocked, happy, sad. We feel surprised. We laugh. We cry. What is it about that visual information, that visual narrative that actually elicits that emotion and how can it affect our emotional states? So to expand on that, what I'm really interested in focusing on moving forward in my research, because of course I'm at the beginning stage at this point, a lot of this is just through observation of the literature that exists, things that I've been interested in from the filmmaker standpoint and also the neuroscientist in training standpoint. Um, but I really want to bridge these two and understanding how the films, the visual input, the visual experiences that we watch can affect our moods, our emotions. Why is it that certain scenes make us feel certain things? Why do we get chills? Why do we cry? Why do we laugh? Why do we get angry? Um, but then also the other way around. So what in our emotional states and what about our affective states can actually influence what type of visual media we choose to watch? Um, why is it that we have given days where we want to watch a scary movie, but then on other days we want to watch a rom-com? Why do we choose to watch something that we know is going to make us cry versus something that we know is going to make us laugh? Kind of things that influence our individual preferences for certain visual experiences. So altogether, I'm really hoping to look through this emotional, this affective lens at all the things I mentioned before, perception, emotion, memory, and social cognition. So understanding how we can learn more about our relation to the world and to others through visual experiences. So with that, thank you so much. I'm really excited to hear your questions and any thoughts you have on the topic and any thoughts you have on my journey in general. That's really cool. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. So um, here's a question for you. Why during a pandemic is all I want to do watch The Office that I've seen 10 times before repeatedly? Like what's, do you have any uh, answers for that yet? I've been asking myself the very same question. I have been watching some shows and movies back that I've seen 20 times before. I mean, I mentioned Scott Pilgrim in the presentation. Yeah. I've watched that a, a few dozen times thus far. Um, you know, I think, at least from my opinion, because I think I speak mostly from observation and I do from expertise at this point, I think there's something about the familiarity of a certain piece of media that, although you've seen it before, you're not watching it for um, kind of the novelty of it, to feel something new. You're watching it to feel comforted by it. You know what the characters are going through, you know what you're going to see, but it's still, you know it's also going to make you laugh, it's going to make you cry. And so there's something about that familiarity that um, sort of uh, taking you back to when you originally watched it and the times you watched it before that I think it's comforting in a way. I think that's one of the main reasons, at least I'm hoping. Otherwise, I have no reason to keep watching the same things. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the world is so unpredictable right now that knowing what's gonna happen is just like, I know what's gonna happen. I know what Jim is gonna say to Pam. I know exactly. what's about like, okay. <sighs> Something is stable uh, in the world right now. Um, Awesome. So, so what were you interested in first? Were you first interested in film or neuroscience or like both at the same time? Like what a cool place you found yourself in um, to study. Yeah, great question. Um, it's really interesting because I would say that if I look at the path that I took, there were times where they were very separate lines and then times that they were very much intertwined. It's, it's very weird. Um, I came from a background where I, you know, knew going into college that I wanted to do something related to science. I thought I was actually going to go to med school for a really long time. And it was right before I applied to schools that my dad said, 
you know, Sade, maybe you should consider studying the brain. I feel like the brain is a really cool organism and or organ, not organism. Um, and you can garner a lot of information there. And I said, no, dad, that's your dream. I want to do like something else completely. But of course I ended up falling in love with neuroscience. And so I've been involved in so many different aspects and types of neuroscience research all through my undergrad career. I was in neurobiology labs. I was in abnormal psychology labs. Um, I was in addiction labs. I was using so many different types of methods. And I think funnily enough, I was meditating on this earlier today. There was actually a point at which I think I was attracted to neuroscience because of the artistic qualities about it. I loved neuroimaging. I loved the way that we were depicting the brain, the way that we were generating images about of what it, you know, we thought the brain was seeing. And so there was something creative about the brain itself that really wanted me to pull, pull into it and study it from a scientific perspective. Um, and I've been, you know, a film lover my whole life, you know, always loved watching various movies growing up and watching everything on Netflix, Hulu, and every other streaming service possible. And it wasn't until my senior year where I actually got to take a film class uh, cinematography course that I got to see those like inner workings of the filmmaking process and get those technical tools and learn more about the vocabulary and said, oh wow, like there's more than just meets the eye. There's more behind the scenes. If anything, it's, it's, it was the reverse of what I loved about neuroscience where I love neuroscience because it was so artistic and I started loving filmmaking because it was so technical. And so I really just along the way when I was doing my full-time position at Duke after graduating, was doing research in neuroeconomics actually, which is the decision-making uh, or kind of decision-making in the brain uh -huh. and had the opportunity to um, kind of in my spare time put together this short film. And I think that in itself was just an exploration of whether or not film was something I could do. And then I stumbled across naturalistic stimuli work in the meantime, like when I was doing that work and said, oh, this is actually being done within the like cognitive sciences, within neuroscience. And so it was this perfect timing where I was falling, I'd fall in love with both of them separately and they came together in such an amazing way. That's amazing. That's really great. Um, I was also really attracted to cell biology because of the microscopy. It's just mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. so beautiful. And I really like being able to like, see what's happening as exactly. opposed to just like getting a band on a gel and having to interpret what that means like seeing the science in like happen um really is where I like to be Absolutely. um awesome so here's a question so I know during during my scientific career um I was kind of going back and forth between uh, marine biology and science communication. And I experienced a fair amount of, of pushback um, on science communication while I was, um, my day job was being a scientist. Mm -hmm. And so have you, like, did either the film folks be like, I don't know about this neuroscience thing, or the neuroscientist folks being like, well, this is a little, you know, like, did you experience any of that yourself? What's really interesting is I think that I was able to kind of, package it so well and work my way in to just get everyone excited about the things that I was excited about that by the time I was doing both simultaneously I guess because I was you know trying or being very careful in terms of the division of time and making sure I was managing my time well like making sure my research wasn't taking away from um, kind of my ability to create, but also that my ability to create wasn't taking away from my ability to do research. And somewhere in the middle of that, also finding time for myself and for friends and for family. Um, I think people just sort of trusted me with that process. But with the science communication element of things, that's so major, because I think the lens through which I've always approached both science and then also both art is the communication of these ideas, the idea of activism, the idea of engaging the audience in something. And so I think it was already so built into the way that I approached both my science and my art um, that merging the two was something that I was able to, I guess, convince people of. And they also were like, I'd like to see where this goes. And at this point, it's really, it's been really cool to get deeper and deeper into the filmmaking community and also get deeper and deeper into the neuroscience and larger science community and talk to people on either side about each other and just say, okay, if anything, we're really working up to a point where everyone needs to be in the same room and have these conversations together because we are such big fans of each other. We're talking about the same things. We have such similar goals. It's about merging and kind of bringing in these disciplines and making it interdisciplinary. 
That's so cool. I love that. Um, so what, when you're trying to answer questions about emotion in film and how the brain affects that and all that, like, what does an experiment that you do, what does that look like? That's a great question. Um, there are so many different techniques that you could employ to do that. And I think that really comes from the barrage of neuroscience uh, measuring techniques that exist right now. So right at the beginning, you measured EEG, for instance, which um, they talk a lot about these two different concepts. So temporal resolution and t- spatial resolution. So understanding how something happens over the course of time and how specific you want to be about at what points in time that's happening and spatial resolution being not, a, it's not as um, important to focus on when it's happening, but where it's happening. So where exactly are we seeing this activity, so on and so forth in the brain. Um, and so depending on what kind of questions you're asking, you'd employ a different technique. EEG is really great for temporal resolution where you can get very, very specific um, information on when something's happening. When are you reacting to this? When are you attending to this? It's really great for attention and memory research, for instance. It's the main technique I use for my undergraduate thesis. While if you're trying to figure out what regions of the brain are engaged or involved in certain processes, so when you're watching something, are you feeling an emotion? When you're watching something, are you you know, engaged by the faces? Are you engaged by the scene? That might be a time where you'd want to use fMRI. And fMRI is functional magnetic resonance imaging. You get stuck in a scanner and you get these really high resolution images of your brain. And so I've seen experiments that have used one or the other, depending again on what the researcher is asking. I've, used, I've seen experiments that have used both and said, we not only want to know when this is happening, but we also want to know where it's happening. Um, and there are also, other than measuring techniques specifically, there are also neuromodulatory techniques. And uh, neuromodulation is just any technique that actually changes the activity of the brain. And so uh, for one of the research labs that I was involved in, we use a technique called TMS, which stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you basically create an, uh, or magnetic field around the brain that then changes the electrical current in the brain and you release certain neurotransmitters and the like. And so then you can actually affect what is, where the brain is active at certain points in time and see if boosting activation or limiting activation also you know, causes different effects. So I guess the long and short answer is there are so many different ways to approach it. It really, it's less about a limitation in methods and more about the limitation of your own imagination when you're designing a question. So cool. So, so cool. So can you be in an MRI with an EEG on or is that like going to It cost depends. It? It's a very, you have to have like specialized kind of fMRI or yeah, fMRI compatible EEG caps if you want to do that and have very specific setups because of course when you have magnets and I mean yeah. the fMRI machine itself is like a giant magnet. So, right. but there are those, those kind of equipment exist right now. So it's really great to see what re- research is happening. That's awesome. So I remember one time I was in an MRI. I don't know if it was an fMRI machine, but either way, I was in there and they had a screen like, so your head has to be super still. Mm -hmm. And then right in front of my face, there was a screen. Mm -hmm. So are you like playing film while watching what's going on in the brain? Absolutely. Yeah. So people do that. And again, there's really um, great equipment that you can create or have noise canceling earphones so people can hear dialogue that's happening. They can also communicate. So aside from, I guess, the neurocinematics focused approach to naturalistic stimuli, um, there's research that people do where they have people telling stories to one another in one MRI machine versus another. So, um, and that's a technique called hyperscanning, where you're basically scanning two people simultaneously, not in the same machine though, in different machines, and seeing how the, yes, I guess how the people interact while during that span of time, but then also how their brains interact. So is there synchrony between the brains? Is there kind of this co-activation? And so when it comes to showing people films, you can actually, you have the screen in the MRI machine and you can play things on there and have them react to that. You can have them interact. Like people do all sorts of cool things. I've heard of people drawing in MRI machines. I've heard of people typing. I could never do that because I just get really like kind of cramped in there, but there are all sorts of different ways to approach it. Awesome. Okay, so you were talking about this um, T, not TMI, T, the yeah. TMS. There we go. Um, so it co- is an experiment that you could try to do, like say, okay, we think that when this part of the brain is active, people are more likely 
to be in the mood for a familiar thing or a novel thing. Um, and then like try to affect it with that machine and then see like, hey, what's you in the mood for? Like, what are you trying to watch today? Is that like a thing that you could do? I guess theoretically it is. I thus far, I guess in the research that I've read with relation to naturalistic stimuli, uh -huh. I haven't read many papers on people employing TMS to understand more about kind of the perception or reaction to naturalistic stimuli use, but uh -huh. I don't see why you couldn't approach it that way because I guess one of the benefits of TMS is it's also, it's a very, or it's known as a non-invasive method, so you don't have to like implant anything in a person's skull. It's just, they have to be very still and the magnet is kind of around their, their head. Mm -hmm. um, and so it could be really interesting to look at, you know, shutting down or bolstering activation in certain regions, especially like the amygdala, for instance, which is a region that's really tied to a lot of emotion and affect and saying, when you increase activation in that area, increase activity, you know, do we see differences in the way that a person will react or their preferences for this, that, or the other? But um, I'm going to keep a tab on that and see <laughs> maybe a few years down the line. Um, when I was using TMS or when I was doing TMS research, we were looking at specifically kind of uh, activating a region to measure whether or not we could increase or decrease participant stress tolerance, or sorry, distress tolerance. So, Ooh. Um, there are different ways and different regions that you have access to versus not having access to. So TMS is an awesome method. So I'd love to see that employed in the future. Super, super cool. So in your experiments that you're doing um, now or you're going to plan to do in the near future, like what are the specific questions that you're asking? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the questions I'm really interested in asking is, what what are the characteristics of the individual that influences their preference for their visual experiences or their visual experiences? So more specifically, if a person is pre um, predisposed to, towards certain emotional states, will they then prefer movies, genres of films that kind of get them to that emotional state? So if you're predisposed to be more sad, will you then prefer to see sad movies or movies that make you happy? Like, are you trying to counter the emotion? Or are you trying to kind of <laughs> invest in or dive into that emotion? Right. Um, and there's a lot of work, I guess, one thing that's really cool about naturalistic stimuli use and neurocinematics as a field in general, kind of as a field that's being created, is because it's so new and because there's so many questions still to ask, what we really have to do is just pull in from all sorts of subfields that already exist and say, okay, we have to take a little bit from the emotion research, we have to take a little bit from social cognition research, we take a little bit from memory research, and then use all of that to form our questions. Um, and so there's so many different ways that they can be shaped together and new avenues that can be explored. Awesome. So cool. So if, okay, like, let's say we're looking 50 years down the line, you've done your body of work. Um, you've answered the questions that you want to answer, um, at least at that point, because, you know, scientists never, never, we've never answered all the questions that we want to answer. That's just not going to happen. Um, cause whenever we get an answer, we get a new question, but Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, I digress. So what would you want the film community to learn from your work and 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 how would you want that to like influence what they do and then the same question for the scientists Ooh, that's a very great great question um i think i would want the film community to take into consideration also there's a cat next to me so if you see a little furry friend hi, no. hi. <laughs> um I would want the film community to take into consideration the cognitive impact that their films can have. Um, and when I say the film community, I really expand it to just the film media entertainment world in general that goes from um, making like filmmakers who focus on narrative work and kind of documentaries, fiction, so on and so forth, but also commercial um, for filmmakers that are making commercials and pushing products towards the their audience their community you know thinking about these things can have lasting long-term impacts they can have very um, immediate impacts on communities they are actually kind of interpreted in a specific way internally um, and that pulls not only from you know this new neurocinematics approach that pulls from media psychology that pulls from neuro uh, consumer neuroscience and 
there's really a lot of work that says the way that something is created does influence the way that it's perceived. Now, from the neuroscientist point of view, I think I'd love there to be um, sort of this evaluation. And there's so much debate always about, like, you know, the way that we approach science. Why do we do the science that we do? And there's questions about should the end goal be to sort of have like this end determinant or end determination of how the brain works, how the human experience is molded. Like does every, I guess, motivation have to have a direct tie to this like yielded factor or something like that. Mm. But I'd almost want us to understand the use of, oh, there's a big cat in my lap, um, the use of naturalistic stimuli for the sake of understanding more about just the films themselves. Like we, we use them, we employ them in our research and it's really great because it helps us under, understand more about the human experience, but it can also help us just understand more about the stimuli itself, like studying the microscopic and macroscopic levels and features and attributes of the films that we're watching. Because in one way or another, we all consume media all the time. We live in a very visual world. And so I think there's a lot of ways that our science can inform how that visual world is shaped. And we can also think about how the visual world shapes our science. That's awesome. Um, I don't want your research to get in the hands of Pixar because they already wreck me emotionally every time. Like I sob. Like Absolutely. So, not just like, oh, here's like, I'm, I'm ugly crying. I'm swollen for hours. Like I can't watch Pixar. It's too much for me. So be careful. I'm, I'm going to be a crying wreck all the time. I think they have some neuroscientists on their team already because I'm just like, how does every movie, how did, how did that robot make me cry? How did that paper clip get into my heart? Yeah. It's, it just pulls my the up, the beginning of up. Oh, mm, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, it was wrecked, <laughs> ruined. Oh, man. Okay, well, anyway, um, we've got a question from Danielle here. Uh, generally speaking, what do we know about emotions in the brain? Ooh, big question. Big, yeah. big question. So we know that we are emotional beings inherently. We know that we can fluctuate through a lot of different affective states over the course of both small time scales and large time scales. So we have moods, we have affect, all sorts of different ways of analyzing it. But I think um, more than anything, especially in the things that I've evaluated thus far, emotion affects so many different parts and kind of components of our lived experience. And so kind of what I was talking about in my presentation, emotion can taint perception, it can taint memory, it can taint social cognition, where, you know, people have done research into whether or not Emotional memories are more salient than neutral memories. Um, I actually just had a paper come out, or a manuscript, or sorry, a preprint come out today about how um, viewing emotional stimuli instead of maybe even using monetary stimuli might have different effects across, you know, different age groups. So when you're showing people faces that are displaying different emotions, does that actually arouse them? Could that then have this, a very similar arousal or sort of way of affecting them like monetary stimuli do? Um, and so emotions are coded and perceived in so many different aspects of our lived experience, not only our own emotions, but then also the emotions of those around us, whether they're people we know, whether they're people we see on TV. Um, and then also everything we consume is very much emotional in ways. So like the media that I was talking about, um, and just yeah, a lot of social interactions. So I think if I had to answer that question, emotions are ever present. And it's really important to understand how instead of evaluating things in a neutral and kind of objective bubble of saying, oh, well, if we present someone with A, they will feel or they will react to it with B. You right. have to think about how context, especially emotional context, can affect all of those different things. Um, we know that emotion or the amygdala is a major brain region that's associated with emotion and affective states. But we also know that there's a lot of other regions that functionally work with the amygdala, um, such as the hippocampus and other um, areas in the medial, medial temporal lobe um, to sort of kind of make it a very uh, comprehensive, holistic uh, reaction when we are feeling a certain emotion. So 
lots to explore there. I'm, I'm looking into, I'm really interested in looking into how emotion plays into everything as well. That's so cool. Your work is just like, this is, this is like so cool. I, I, I wasn't um, expecting this to be, no, I wasn't not expecting this to be cool, but I was expecting to be talking more about like uh, neurons and synapses. And this is the coolest. Yes, and I just, like, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm like overwhelmed by how cool this is. Um, okay. So is there anything that you wish we asked today? Something you're like, man, I really wish we could have talked about this hmm. thing. I guess, I mean, especially for this being a talk that is ideally catered to a high school audience, I think thinking about the journey into being a scientist before even getting to college, so like what, what comes into play there, and then while you're in college and then afterwards, because I know for a time I didn't actually know how to become a scientist. I said, well, I'm gonna become a doctor, I'm gonna go to med school because you know it's this clear shot path. Um, but then somewhere along the line, I said, oh, you can actually like, ask questions full time. That can be your entire career. That sounds really cool. Um, and I, I almost wish I had some of those tools and had gotten to ask those questions really early on. So maybe where, when do you start becoming a scientist? But that's a huge question. And I don't know, if, oh gosh, I just realized I asked to be asked that. Yeah. I, the answer. <laughs> I think as long as you're asking questions, you're a scientist, mm. for sure. Although I, I was in the same boat as you. Like when I was in high school, I, I knew I loved squid had no idea what a scientist does that, did, that like does no idea I'd never met one I like I didn't know how to get there I was just like you know what we're gonna go to college and I'm sure we'll figure it out along the way yeah, my parents exactly. were like I guess you're working in an aquarium right and I was like well maybe I don't know I don't know so anyway uh yeah and so for anyone who's new to Skype a scientist um the way our program works is that we basically match families during the pandemic and classrooms, scout troops, libraries of adults, whoever, um, groups of people with scientists for Q and A's, just like this one, but in smaller groups. And so um, if you at home are like, I really wanna know more about sharks, I really wanna know more about space exploration, whatever you think is something that you might wanna get into as an adult, um, check out our website. It's totally free to get matched. And you can even look, we have like a scientist search tool. If you hover over a uh, chat with a scientist and then click the scientist search tool, um, you can type in neuroscience, you can type in whatever you think is cool, and then request that scientist specifically so that you can uh, get contact with someone in that field, ask them questions. Um, and yeah, that's what we're all about, connecting scientists with everybody else. Um, yeah, okay, so we have two questions that we ask everybody at the end, end of these sessions. The first, Absolutely. Wonderful. So the first is, um, you have the attention of everybody in the world in this moment. You can tell them one thing about neuroscience. What do you tell them? Or, or neuroscience in film. Hmm. Oh, this is a lot of pressure. Okay. A lot of pressure. Thankfully, it's a hypothetical situation. True, I was about to say world. Thank you for listening. Um, I think what I would tell them is that the brain is an organ that is as mysterious as it is accessible. Ooh. So there's always something to be discovered. There's always something to be researched. There's always something to be asked. And the wild thing is that while we're discovering and researching and asking all of these questions, we're actively using our brains to do it. So it's almost like this weird meta situation where our brains are investigating our brains, but our brains probably know these things, but they're just not, lots of folds in there. Um, and so there's always questions to be asked and there's always questions to be answered. So that's one of the coolest things about the brain. Amazing, mm -hmm. solid answer. Um, someone just said, why is Sade so cool? It's like, I, we don't know, just, it just is, it just is true. Um, and so the second question is, you still have everybody's in the world's attention, but you can tell them one thing about anything but neuroscience. Like any, it can be as like silly or insignificant or like big picture important as you'd like. Ooh, that's another important question. Um, so if I were talking to the world, because I, I actually have an answer for high schoolers specifically, but then I also have an answer for the larger world or like the larger world community. Um, my answer for the world would be spend, no, I don't wanna give them advice. That's because I'm too young to give advice right now. Um, I would say the thing that I would want to tell the world is, or ask the world is have you smiled today? 
honestly and truly. That's just about it. I was going to say give someone a hug, but we're supposed to be social distancing. I was going to say go outside, but some people have to stay inside. So the question would be, have you smiled today? Um, and for high schoolers, because I want to kind of speak to that group specifically too, is make sure that in the midst of trying to figure out who you're going to be in the future, like years from now, you're also just appreciating who you are in the present. Um, like you don't have to have it all figured out. I had no idea however long ago I was in high school. I graduated in 2014. So that feels like it was 50 years ago, but it's still 2020. So six years ago, um, I had no idea that I'd be doing what I was going to be doing now and heading into the field that I'd be heading into. And I spent so much time worrying about that and trying to like shape my future instead of just saying, wow, Shade, you're a pretty cool high schooler. Like you're just, you're chilling, you know, you're having fun, you're playing sports, you're doing art stuff. And so just enjoy who, who you are right now in the midst of also trying to figure out who you're going to be. Solid. Thank you, Shade, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. This was uh, a delight uh, to round off our, uh, our Q&As today with. Um, is there anything you want to plug and um, where can we find you on social media? Great question. So I have all the social medias in existence, except for MySpace. I don't think that that, I don't think that still exists. Um, you can visit me at my website, which is www.shade.space, which is S-A-D-E dot space. Um, you should check out my short film. So other, or in addition to all of the wonderful programming that Black and Neuro has been doing this week, they actually featured my short film yesterday and got to do a Q&A with that. So that's still available, I think, up until the end of this week. Um, and yeah, I think you can find me on Twitter as well. My handle, I think, is tagged on a lot of the Skype a scientist social media, and so you'll find it there. And if you want to talk more, just reach out. I might take forever to get to you, but that's only because I like start pre grad school things next week, but I will answer. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. And Erin, thank you for signing for us today. Um, we are the next time we're going to be gathering here together will be um, on the 10th of August, and we're going to be talking about um, reef restoration uh, with Liz Burmester. So uh, tune in then. We'll be talking about like all different kinds of reefs, like uh, oyster reefs and coral reefs. And, and so, you know, get ready. It's going to be a good one. Um, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Uh, thank you again for joining us. This was the best. All right. Absolutely. And this will be posted to YouTube after. I'll send you a link. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Oh, wait, before we leave, um, don't forget, go to bit.ly slash neuroscience kit to enter to win one of those, um, an EEG if you're interested. Okay, for real though, by this time. Okay, bye.